Welcome to the HC Insider Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the commodities sector and the people within it. I'm your host, Paul Chapman. Today, we're talking commodity futures markets and in particular the agri-futures markets, where it all started. We talk about open outcry and the moving to electronic trading, random walks and efficient market hypothesis, and the political battles that come from rising prices and the blaming of speculators. What's the role of indexes and what might the future for the agri-futures markets hold? Our guest is eminent economist Scott Irwin, who spent a career studying the agri-futures markets. He's based at the University of Illinois and has recently published a book called Back to the Futures, Crashing Dirt Bikes, Chasing Cows and Unraveling the Mystery of the Commodity Futures Markets. As always, you can support the show by leaving us a positive review on the platform you're listening on and also like and share our content on social media, particularly LinkedIn and Twitter. And I hope you enjoy the episode. Scott, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. This is really a discussion against the backdrop of your book, Back to the Futures. And we're, we're talking about the futures market, particularly in ag, uh, which is obviously the oldest futures market. And some of the, the learning and understanding that you built through your career and, and a lot of that's analogous to the subsequent rise of other futures markets in the commodities world. But let's, let's start, at, I guess, at the beginning. Let's start with, you know, everyone can visualize trading places. <laughs> Tell us, it was open outcry, right? You know, you had traders in the pit, you had runners filling these orders and so forth. Can you just talk to us about open outcry? Because obviously that's since transitioned to electronic trading. But talk to us about open outcry and I guess the the positives and negatives of it. Well, great. It really seems like a highly inefficient system relative to, you know, the silently purring servers and the electronic algorithms and the electrons traveling around for this incredibly new system that trades at the speed of light. So the old system was like, wow, that's like horse and buggy era. But it really was kind of a remarkably robust mechanism for the trading technology that was available, which was People had to be face-to-face to match trades. Fundamentally, that's what open outcry was like. It was essentially a big public continuous auction. That's really what was going on in the trading pits. And, you know, it was an outgrowth of the way kind of organized, centralized cash trading, you know, has evolved for millennia in market economies. And so they just learned that you could get together, trade these standardized forward contracts that became known as futures contracts. And, you know, the strengths were for the available technology, you know, it was telegraph and then telephones and and then teleticker systems that face-to-face open outcry matching of trades by humans face to face worked really well for the technology of the time of course you know i'd say the two major disadvantages were one that there was a basically a fixed limit of the capacity for trading in that system because it was just limited by the number of people and the number of hours that they could withstand that kind of intense trading environment where people are shouting and screaming and making arm motions to transact trades that was limited to four hours a day for a reason. And then in that environment, which is clearly a little wilder than what we have now, there's there's clear was, I think, more scope for abuse and advantages by particular groups just simply because the rules had to be, I think, a little less well-defined for how trading could take place. Yeah. And, and there sort of one of the biggest things was front running and, and, and we'll come on to sort of some of the the benefits and kind of the why pushing to electronic trading and, and how that unlocked these markets. Just help us understand though, we're talking Chicago, Mm -hmm. why Chicago, Chicago board of trade and, and, and the CME, why Chicago? And, 
why ag? Why why did we see? And these are quite ancient, as you point out. Futures markets have been going on for quite you know hundreds of years. Why ag and why Chicago? Well, when the futures markets developed, it reflected the agricultural nature of the United States economy. Probably, you know, this goes back to the 1840s, 50s, 60s, when agriculture, I don't have the exact number on top of my head, but probably represented something close to 40 or 50 percent of our economy. And in particular, then what was happening with the settlement of the United States is that agriculture pushed west. And in the middle part of the 19th century, you had this really explosion of agricultural crop production in what we now call the Midwest or the Corn Belt in the areas that are adjacent to Chicago. And corn and wheat, which previously in the United States had been concentrated in the East Coast, what we would call the Mid-South region now, it moved into Illinois, Southern Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, and of course, Illinois, Wisconsin, that area was being settled in huge increases in production of, uh, in particular, corn and wheat, rye, barley, those kind of crops. And so naturally, those commodities were being produced there, but much of the consumption of those commodities was occurring on the eastern half of the United States, where most of the population was, and the demand for meat and the use of those grains and food products like wheat flour where the consumption would occur. And so you had to get it from the, this new burgeoning production area in the Midwest to the East Coast. And so transportation systems developed and you had major collection points that we call now terminal elevators developed to help collect and then move the grain to where it was needed. And Chicago was one of those major transshipment points. The two biggest competing transshipment points uh, in the Midwest at that point in time were Chicago and St. Louis. And for various historical reasons, Chicago won out as the major transshipment point. And then cash grain trading became very active in Chicago. And the organization of futures markets then grew out of the centralized cash grain trading that was taking place in Chicago. And that is basically why the commodity futures, well, they're now, you know, the center of global futures trading is Chicago, but it happened because the futures exchanges developed in Chicago on an agricultural base of cash grain trading in the mid 19th century you know that's that's where the futures markets traded and then it wasn't really till almost uh, really more than 100 years later until they broke out of their agricultural roots and started trading things like uh, interest rates and currencies yeah yeah and there's a you know when some of the we'll come on to it right when when when, you, when onions got banned from trading people sought other commodities to trade instead right because these things are the you know the seabot was an in, enormous engine of wealth creation as well for these traders right and there's stories in your book it's the book starts we're talking about a, a young trader who went on to be the ceo you know and, and his start in this um can you just give us a couple of words i guess on that on the wealth creation of these traders in chicago and then talk to us about the the push and the reasons for going electronic because again you know we've still got the lme on on open outcry you know there's there's that, there was resistance to that oh absolutely that in itself is just an epic story that i have um feature in the, in particular, the last third of the, the book. I, I think the best way to illustrate it is Leo Malamed told me that in the early 1990s, the CME did a study, not adjusted for inflation, that in the early 1990s, the floor traders or members of the CBOT and CME between them were generating a billion dollars of net income. That's a, even by Chicago standards, that's a huge <laughs> chunk of the income generation in the Chicago metro area. So economically, 
the income produced by these two exchanges was very important to the basically pit traders. So that gives you an idea of the stakes, economic stakes that were involved in the people that were at risk from the transition to electronic trading. And so the story is it took a good 20 years for that transition to really fully take place. And, you know, there was basically tremendous resistance from the floor trading community because, I mean, it's really a great untold story of digital technology disrupting another industry. And that's exactly what electronic trading is. It's the replacement of human traders transacting that I described a few minutes ago by computers doing that. It's a version of like, if you go into McDonald's, I was in one just the other day, and you go to a kiosk now in many McDonald's to key in your uh, your order. Well, you've replaced a, a human being who previously took your order. And the transition from pit trading to electronic trading is just doing that writ large. And mm. that displacement cost some people huge amounts of money. Yeah. And and where has that, so that displacement, it's essentially taken, so those are proprietary trading profits that have been taken out of the hands of the pit traders and then dispersed much more broadly, you know, it's a much more efficient market as a result, right? Is that is that a fair description? You know, the, the, it's sort of, a, well, the book is riddled with zero-sum games. Has it been a zero-sum game for those uh, pit traders? Well, that's an interesting question that we really don't know the exact answer to your question. There are some things that we do know, Paul. One is that per contract, transaction costs on the major futures exchanges with electronic trading have fallen dramatically, dramatically. But we also know that the volume of trading has gone up dramatically as well. But what we don't know is how much more concentrated the industry is in terms of the market making. So when I talk about costs for futures trading, I, I don't mean brokerage commissions. What I'm talking about are what I call, or an economist call, order execution costs. It's the market impact of your trade. In other words, if I, I want to, in other than trader speak, it's the size of the bid ask spread that you have to pay to transact in these markets. Uh, so yeah. if I want to buy, I'm going to have to buy at a price a little bit higher than the prevailing current price because my order will push the market up just a little bit and vice versa for a sell order. That's that's the bid ask bounce that we talk about. And mm. it's just absolutely clear that, the, that that is now dramatically smaller than it used to be. But the volume of trading has gone up. I think the industry is probably more concentrated. So the the net income from market making in the futures markets is probably more concentrated, but I don't know if it in total is bigger or smaller because I don't know which one, the volume of trading or the fall in the order execution returns for market making, which one is bigger. Yeah, and we'll probably return to that in the with the LME later on in this story. Mm -hmm. But so let's stay on trading then. And the book mm -hmm. has some, some rich anecdotes. You know, each chapter starts with, I guess, a personal story and then relates that to an event or trend in the in the futures markets that you, you went through through the course of your, your career. You know, there's one about your your dad, I think, thinking he's a great trader and not <laughs> actually being one. And your your mum turning out to be a really good trader and still, still going at it. This brings me on to sort of this journey of kind of, the understanding of the efficient market hypothesis mm -hmm. and this random walk and, you know, an idea that you can flip a coin and the results of that actually seem to map quite clearly onto the day-to-day -day trading of stocks or futures in ags and so on. And then I guess your journey from being a, a firm believer in the efficient market hypothesis, I, no one can, no one can make more money than another person. There's no edge to actually believing that there is an edge and where that now lands. Can you just take us on that journey? Because I found that bit particularly fascinating. Oh, I, I'm really glad that you asked that question because that, that that's really kind of the central 
arc running through my professional and personal fascination with the commodity futures markets. You know, when I was an undergraduate and a graduate student, I think I probably reflected, even today, an average person's view that there's a world of money to be made in the commodity futures markets speculating. And surely it's not that hard to, it's so easy to, easy to trade. And there's so many smart people around. I think I'm pretty smart. Therefore, I should be able to make a lot of money. That's very unsophisticated thinking, as it turns out. And that's the way I kind of approached the markets. I was influenced by uh, a mentor at Purdue who was really big into charting and technical analysis. And that contributed to my idea that, you know, here was the golden key that unlocked the markets. And the markets, when I was in graduate school, I almost traded my way out of graduate school in a great trading disaster <laughs> of uh, August 1981, seared permanently into my brain cells. And I think a $5,000 loss. Yeah, case, something like that. A, a young uh, graduate it, student. Oh, yes. It's all based on, even at the time, an illegal use of my, or at least highly inappropriate use of my of student loan money, financed my speculative binge back in 1981. But I did pay it all off. So if there's any, you know, government listeners out there, <laughs> it was all paid off. But that experience really was... Uh, critical because, you know, it was like, a, you know, getting punched in the gut and going, I don't really understand these markets at all. And took me on a long intellectual journey of trying to understand, can you really make money in these markets? Can you beat the markets? And so in graduate school in the early 80s, I, I first read Burton Malkiel's book, A Random Walk Down Wall Street. And that was just like a, a bolt of electricity through my thinking about the markets. And so for a time, I, I really was converted fully to the gospel of random walks and efficient market hypothesis. And I really believe that that's the operating model for the markets. And then, you know, later in my career, particularly under the influence of uh, my good friend and colleague for many years here at the University of Illinois, Daryl Good, and some results that started coming out in the 1990s in the behavioral finance literature kind of chipped away at that belief that the markets were 100% fully all the time efficient and in the sense that the market always fully reflects all available information and it was only a fool's journey who tried to beat the market. The position that I hold now that I think is actually an intellectually much more logical and coherent view is markets literally cannot be perfectly efficient. Grossman and Stiglitz in a famous paper worked this out, late 80s, 90s, can't remember the date. You know, basically for markets to operate dynamically, there has to be an economic return to the collection uh, and interpretation of information, building forecasting models, collecting weather data, on and on and on, any market you can give an example. There has to be a return to that or the market collapses because if there's no return, if I know at a priori, if I know I collect this piece of data, spend tens of thousands of dollars collecting the data, tens of thousands, maybe millions of dollars in building a system to interpret it, yet I know ahead of time that I will never be able to make money using that information and system I built, well, then I will never build it. And then if I apply that logic to the market at large, well, the market ceases. And that's a fundamental contradiction that lies at the heart of the efficient market hypothesis. So that led me to understanding and looking for evidence that was consistent with, I think, a, a much more intellectually coherent view that someone has to have an edge in the market and they have to be paid for that edge. Uh, and I do believe that, but I think the great sorting out of who has that edge is itself a very volatile process with even very well-informed, experienced, rich traders blowing up with disturbing frequency. Mm. And there's also, I think, characteristics of people that in essence, make great traders. And, you know, some work suggests that out of the general population, maybe only one or two percent of people 
are the kind of people that can get and keep an edge in these markets. And some of it's also to do with size of organizations being able to have the resources to collect them. But, you know, there's big organizations that have made huge trading missteps, and we see them in the financial press all the time. Mm. So that's kind of the story of my intellectual journey about the great engine of economic efficiency, as I call it in my book. Yeah, there's lots of points there, isn't there? The first one on that kind of percentage of, and obviously we're in the business of placing traders and have been for many years, you know, I, 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 you know anecdotally from, from our perspective, we would agree that there's sort of these one, maybe 5% of, of traders seem to be able to make money even from a blank desk right there's you know they don't have any of the physical systems yes. and say well they just seem to have that that capability now it might all just be complete the outcome of rolling a dice and you get 10 sixes in a row right who knows but i would agree with that and then and actually there's sort of this aristotelian sort of know thyself quality as well about what is it as a trader that the information that you're leveraging whether it's your colleagues whether it's the physical system around you that gives you that edge and there's also that edge has changed as well if you look at the the big ag houses you know they've had to get and this is true of all commodities as well they've had to get more and more into the physical into storage into these bottlenecks of very rare and unique information as most information is now much more democratized right you look at gas trading in you know in right. early enron days right they had they, they had systems that no one they had information that no one else had now that information is available very cheaply for subscription and I also just, I know I'm rattling on, but I would say, you know, for the most part, though, it makes sense for for me to believe firmly in Bernard Malkiel's book and trade, you know, and just buy indexes over the period of time because, you know, those two things aren't mutually exclusive, right? For most people, most of the time, it is efficient markets. You can't beat it. It's just those one or two unique organizations that have invested a lot of money and training and talent in actually trying to capture those edges. There are times when the market goes a little bit crazy as well, right? And we've got some, some stuff coming up on Brent where this might be a, a factor as well. But mm -hmm. just after the financial crisis, we had this period of non-convergence, which was alarming to the, the futures community. And you were instrumental in understanding what was going on and why that happened. Can you define non-convergence for us? Why it's so important and potentially dangerous and and in this particular instance where you know what it was about the contracts that that made that happen sure well in the grain futures contracts at the chicago board of trade which is now part of the cme so i'm just going to use cbot just to, because that's what's in my head for so many decades convergence is the property of built in, you know, that's supposed to be a property of all well-functioning commodity futures contracts that have physical delivery uh, for the contract. That means during the delivery period near expiration, you can exchange the literally paper futures contract for physical grain. So if I'm long and if I stand for delivery, I can ultimately purchase physical grain. Likewise, if I'm on the short side of the market, I will have and stand for delivery, then I will have to provide a buyer with physical grain. Okay, that's so that that's important first understanding. And a bedrock principle for commodity futures contracts with physical delivery is that the price of the futures contract and the price of the physical commodity in the delivery locations during the delivery period should come together or what we call converge. And that's based on something as simple as the law of one price, which is that the same commodity at the same location at the same time, two lots should sell for the same price. And so if you can exchange the futures for the cash, then the price should be the same thing. Futures should come together with the cash. And all functioning of commodity futures markets rest on that bedrock principle that, you know, we can argue 
until the cows come home before expiration about whether the cash or the futures is the right price at any moment in time, but that they always have to come together, in essence, settle the differences during the delivery period. And hedging strategies, risk management strategies are built upon the assumption that that always happens. And it's such a normal feature of the operation of commodity futures markets with physical delivery that when it doesn't happen, it is an just incredibly alarming event because it's just the normal functioning of these markets in the background. And so when it doesn't happen, it is a major, major, major problem. And so that's what convergence is and why it is so important to the markets. Perfect. And then obviously that did start happening and was alarming and no one could quite figure out why. Can you talk to us a little bit about that story? Sure. So this really happened, started happening in about 2005. The corn, soybeans and wheat futures markets, particularly wheat futures market in Chicago, started to not converge. And initially, the degrees of non-convergence that were so alarming were maybe 20 or 30 cents of non-convergence at delivery time. And in the grain markets that the price levels we were at, that was historically very large, very alarming. And then it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. And at the peak of the problem in September 2008, the Chicago wheat futures contract went off the board during expiration with the futures more than $2 a bushel above the cash price in wheat delivery locations in Chicago and Toledo. Mm. And it, everybody's just going, the wheat market is broken. I mean, everybody said that nothing like this had ever happened historically. We'd had some brief periods of non-convergence that in the past had typically, almost exclusively actually, happened due to manipulations. You can get convergence problems when you have a corner and squeeze. And that literally is what happens. You get a non-convergence that's being caused by manipulation. That can happen. But those last literally, typically a few days or a few weeks. Here we have non-convergence of an orders of magnitude that we've never seen lasting years at a time. And so why wouldn't you conclude that the markets are broken? And so it just so happened that these episodes of non-convergence were really at their worst in 07, 08, at exactly the time that we saw grain and crude oil and other commodity prices uh, reaching historical peaks and people seeking explanations for why the commodity prices were spiking so much, which then one of the explanations for the run-up in commodity prices was the massive passives or long index fund investment in these markets, which was new and very large at the time. And so people naturally said, oh, not only does the new demand from these index investors explain the spike in commodity prices. It explains what's going on in the grain futures market. The index demand was creating a bubble in the futures prices that was holding up the grain futures prices well above the cash. And that was the official conclusion of a U.S. Senate permanent subcommittee that investigated this in 2009. It was all due to the index funds causing bubbles in the commodity futures markets. So that was kind of conventional wisdom at the time among many people, including lots of people in the grain industry. And you can talk to people that traded during that time, and many of them still blame mm. the non-convergence on the, on the index funds. So that was the situation. And the, the problem was, for those of us that were skeptical of that explanation for various reasons, mainly economists, you can't beat something with nothing. And we didn't really know what was driving 
this historical magnitude of non-convergence. Uh, we'd never seen it before, and we didn't have anything that literally explained it. So I uh, was fortunate to work with an intrepid group of three other agricultural economists set off on a basically about a six or seven year journey to try to basically figure out what was driving these historical episodes of non-convergence in the grain futures markets. And it turned out that it was a very simple disequilibrium between what the market thought was the value of storage in grain delivery elevators and the rate that the CBOT slash CME allowed to be charged if you took delivery of the grain through the futures market. And it took us a while to figure that out, but once we saw that that was in disequilibrium, we worked out some models that basically matched really nicely and explained the episode, not the index funds. The HC Insider Podcast is brought to you by HC Group, a retained search, intelligence, and advisory firm focused solely on the global energy and commodity sector. With six locations across Asia, Europe, and the Americas, and over 50 consultants. To find out more, go to our website, hcgroup.global. There, you can also sign up for our HC Insider content for more interviews and white papers on relevant trends and talent impacts in the commodities world. And this is friend of the show, Craig Perron, was right there alongside you in front of this Senate subcommittee. I mean, it's fascinating how, and much of the book is essentially economists, you included, how you're getting drawn into these political battles over these quite heuristic, you know, it feels like it should be true, right? All this money flowing into indexes, all these speculators are essentially yes. taking rent from hard paying, hard working Americans and Brits and whoever it might be and making tons of money off it. But actually, your work is about proving that these for, these futures markets and the role of speculators, yes, they obviously they get an economic return. They must do because they're providing liquidity to these to the hedges but actually how important they are to well-functioning markets. And, it's, and as you said, it's the, the construction of the future that was at issue, not the, the role of speculators. Um, we're going to come back to indexes, but there's a sort of this fascinating story about onions, and, and it, it combines both those two narratives, right? Yes, you might have a bad actor, and then you get politicians involved, and then you end up with a less efficient market. Can you talk to us about onions, the only commodity banned from being traded in futures in, in the U.S.? Well, yes, you know, so almost immediately from when commodity futures markets, and we'll go back and call them just the grain futures markets developed in Chicago and elsewhere in the United States and in other countries in the mid to latter part of the 19th century, immediately they became a focus of attacks. For example, my favorite the wheat futures market in Chicago was said by one observer in the 1880s to be trading wind wheat, <laughs> you know, false wheat, not real wheat. And so it's just all, you know, there were a virtually continuous string of efforts and bills introduced in the United States Congress to ban trading in grain futures markets from the 1880s all the way into the 1970s in the United States. And this reached its apogee in the 1950s with, of all things, onions futures trading. It turns out that right after World War II, the most successful commodity futures contract that the Chicago Mercantile Exchange had at the time was their onion contract. The CME at that point in time was the little brother to the big brother of the CBOT, which had the big grain futures contracts, which dwarfed the trading size or volumes of the CME at the time. And the little CME was surviving in the 50s on their onion futures contract. And 
There were some various delivery controversies that occurred at the time, but Various groups of onion producers and others basically took hold of that narrative and were able to then convince the United States Congress in 1958 to pass a law banning trading in onion futures, and it was signed into law by President Eisenhower. And that law is still on the books. It is still illegal in the United States to trade futures on onions. Mm. Provides us a a fascinating insight, a control group almost, for commodities that don't have a futures market. And and the learning, can you share the learning from that? Right. So this launched uh, some of the best work I think agricultural economists have done in our long and I believe storied tradition to take a look at the postmortem. Okay. You banned onion futures trading. What's the market impact of banning this? And again, it, as economists, it's a great natural experiment to test. We have a before and an after that's very clear. And in a famous 1963 article, uh, one of my favorite agricultural economists, Roger Gray, wrote a, a famous article called Onions Revisited. And what he did was he documented that what we would call within season price volatility increased dramatically after onion futures trading was banned. In other words, there's a normal seasonal increase in onion futures from the fall when they're harvested to the spring as they need to be stored. And what Gray showed was in the roughly the decade after onion futures were banned, that increase was much more sharp than it was when you had futures trading because basically merchants would bid less to farmers in the fall because they had no way of offloading their risk. And then in the spring, they would charge more to consumers as they were taking them out of storage. In essence, they didn't have speculators to offload the risk of price changes during the storage period interseasonally or intraseasonally. And therefore, it was costing everyone more to manage the price risk in the onion futures market without futures markets than when we had futures markets. Mm -hmm. Still, in my opinion, the best, most straightforward way to make the case of the critical role that speculators play in allowing a more efficient redistribution of price risk through the economic system. Yeah, and a, a very relevant story for today and we've had, you know, last year at least a huge run up in commodity prices, especially in energy in Europe and sparking a lot. This, a lot of the similar narratives come up and these are pretty bruising fights, right? I mean, you're, the battle that you and, and Craig had in the Senate against sort of, you know, as the only two economists there compared to the other expert witnesses who had different axes to grind and you can read the book to discover. But Gary Gensler, now, now head of the SEC, was pretty, it was a pretty knockdown drag, drag out experience and culminated even, you know, in this New York Times piece where eviscerated, well, basically ad hominems attacks about your integrity. I mean, quite powerful stuff, you know, the, the political lobby against speculating. Well, you know, for a mild mannered agricultural economist, it was quite a startling experience to be thrown into the uh, rough and tumble of a real political battle. Coming out of 07 08, there was this broad effort politically to much more tightly regulate speculation in all physical commodity futures markets, and it all came to a head with this effort to uh, extend federally regulated speculative position limits, which have been around for a long time on ag markets, to all physical markets, including crude oil and, and everything. And so Craig and I were very much involved in that debate publicly. 
I also did a lot of research with my uh, colleague Dwight Sanders trying to test, you know, okay, what's the evidence? The Commodity Exchange Act says that in order to justify uh, changing or adding a new speculative position limits, you must meet what's called the necessity principle, which is you have to show empirically that the uh, limits are necessary to rein in unwarranted speculation. And so we did a ton of work trying to look for a relationship between index fund trading and large price changes in commodity futures markets, and we could never find it. And so basically, that's what I said. And that's what Craig said based on his own work. And of course, that really upset those that were pushing for tighter position limits and tighter limits in general on speculative trading in commodity futures markets. And Gary Gensler had made that one of his major priorities to do just that uh, when he was the head of the CFTC. So you can imagine that that put uh, Craig and I directly in his crosshairs. Yeah, as the as the uh, crypto industry is today, right? Exactly. Which we might come on to, but it turned out, you know, as you say in the book, that the the answer for commodity price run ups lay in U.S. monetary policy and China demand, right? I mean, you know, it was sort of uh, staring in the face to some extent. But um, there's you you're also doing a lot of work on indexes. And there's this, mm-hmm. this theory that, you know, there's a, a risk premium. So you buy this index and, and hedgers should be willing to give you economic rent for the, for the ability for them to hedge. That turns out, well, not to be the case. And, and so can you just help us understand that? And then kind of when you think actually anyone could possibly even make money from commodity indexes? Great question. So we have to go back to Lord Maynard Keynes, who was the originator of this idea that you should view a commodity futures market as an insurance market. So it's an insurance metaphor. So you have people who are producing or carrying a commodity, corn, and they don't want to be exposed to price risk. So they basically forward sell it to someone. And then so that someone is usually a speculator. And in this insurance metaphor, the speculator is providing price insurance for the producer. And they will demand a return for providing that insurance. Well, the way in the markets, Keynes thought that that insurance premium was exchanged was in the form of biased prices before expiration. So in other words, if I'm a farmer in the springtime and I don't want to have price exposure for my growing crops and I sell in the futures market to a speculator who's long, and we'll just throw out a number and say that the market price based on fundamentals is $5 a bushel, well, the speculator will only buy from that farmer if they're able to buy at, say, four ninety a bushel. So there's a ten cent premium below the rational current market price. In essence, the speculator is allowed to buy cheap. And then the price as it converges the futures towards the cash price at expiration, it will tend to rise over time, providing that risk premium return to the long speculator. That's the theory. It's been argued about in the literature ever since Keynes proposed it in the 20s and 30s. And there's a long, long, long literature in agricultural economics, my subfield of economics, that says, no, there's no evidence that there's any significant premium in commodity futures markets like that. There are some financial economists, uh, particularly some that started writing, you know, in the early 2000s that said, claim that no, there really is that premium in there if you you do the research a certain way. And that was one of the foundations that the index industry was built upon, this explosion of investment in the commodity indexes that really started about 
2003-2004. So that that's the foundation as best as I can explain it. <laughs> and And you kind of end up at this point that really – you can only really make returns in commodity indexes if you call a, a super cycle correctly, right? If there's an overall right. structural shift up in prices and you're not, you are not, you're there for yourself just by holding on to these things, benefiting from them. This is way above my, uh, my economics learning. We've done a couple of episodes on, on indexes. No, no, I think, I think you've got it exactly right. <laughs> yeah, slightly cloudy and, uh, but, um, very interesting. So, okay. And it's good to have, uh, Lord Maynard Keynes on the um, on the show. We we speak a lot about Hayek yeah. as well. So, but uh, you know, there's a there's a, <laughs> a history to that in the podcast. Okay. If I if I could add one more point on that, if I might, Paul. Yeah. The proof, the ultimate proof is in the pudding. We've had ETFs on the major commodity indexes since uh, I have to go back and look exactly, but something like 2007, 2008, and. Uh, if you go look at the returns to the ETFs on the major commodity indexes like the GSCI, they have lost money through this huge bull run in commodity futures prices. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we've uh, we've we've had a few people on early calling uh, calling for a super cycle that uh, didn't materialize, and obviously you know there's a the headwinds of monetary policy and all the rest of it. But uh, fascinating, and I, I think you're also publishing a book on indexes or your work on that. Can you just talk to that for two seconds? Because I think people will be interested in it. Oh yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, along with my colleague Dwight Sanders, we just published this month. Uh, Another book, and this one from CABI, another, another great British scientific publishing company. And that book is basically what we did is we put together 11 of the articles that were foundational to our research as it contributed to this debate about the role of commodity index funds in the futures markets in the last 15 years. And so we've done research that has addressed things over time in that debate. And so we thought it was useful to republish those articles in one volume in a sequential ordering that made sense to us. And then what's really unique about it is we wrote new author forwards to each of the articles containing hopefully interesting to read backstories about how we decided to write the articles, a little bit about the process, any controversies, any interesting backstories, and then also step back and saying, what's the legacy of each of these different articles? So I think it's a, a really interesting, unique contribution to the literature in the area. Yeah, and complements the work that Ivo Saryanovich, another friend of the show, has been doing on, on commodities as a hedge for inflation or not, is the case. So uh, we'll put a link to that uh, that book, your book in the, well, both books in the show notes for, for listeners who are interested. Okay, in the, in the time we have left, I have two, two questions. The first is... Mm -hmm. And you reference it in the book, the LME debacle, and we've done an entire episode on it and, and how it came to pass with, with Jack Farchi, if listeners are interested. Mm -hmm. the, the most interesting aspect of that is essentially losers were not allowed to lose and winners were not allowed to win and the, the moral hazard that, that has created and, and how dangerous that is for markets functioning efficiently. Can you just give us your sort of insight? Was this a, a huge blunder by the LME? Did they have any other choice? And, and, and what lessons, what, you know, could we see similar things happen in a more volatile commodity world that we're, we are expecting to have over the next 10, 20 years in the CME and other, you know, other exchanges? It is an incredibly important episode because it illustrates something that is very poorly understood, in my opinion, about these markets. Number one, they're central to the functioning of the entire market chain in these various commodities. They're central to the information processing, price discovery, and risk management roles of functioning in these markets. And, and we're just so used to these markets playing that role you know they just kind of purr and hum in the background we don't 
hear much about them and they're just working, they're working, they're working and contributing to the efficiency of the system over time in these different ways. But it turns out that these beautiful market machines are actually very delicate. And they're delicate in the sense for them to perform, for them to purr along like they do, you have to have a very delicate, nuanced balance between basically the natural longs and the natural shorts in the market. There's a constant kind of negotiation over balancing the interests of those natural longs, natural shorts in the markets uh, so that the terms of the contract don't favor one side of the market or the other. And there's a whole history uh, that we could go into on that. But then if we delve one step deeper for those markets to continue purring along, absolutely one principle that the exchanges cannot violate is directly intervening and favoring in a large and significant way one side of the market. When the exchange itself changes the rules of the game in an obvious, unmistakable, and huge way to bail out one side or the other, you have destroyed the market because no one will ever again trust that the terms of the contracts are going to be enforced. And you're done. You're just done once the trading community has lost trust and faith in basically the fairness and balance between the long and the short side of the market. And the LME, in my opinion, is the biggest blunder of my lifetime in managing a commodity futures contract because they violated what cannot be violated. Mm, mm. It's also, I mean, it's fascinating to hear you say that. And I think there's lots of people, listeners would agree. There's also in that sort of fine, delicate balancing of an exchange. And, and part of the story of the book in some ways, when you talk about non-convergence is the contract also needs to try and reflect reality. And you've got right. a lot of divergence in these metals grades where some you know some nickels suitable for batteries some's not and you're you, you start ending up with these imperfect hedging tools and all the rest of it but yeah yeah i think that lme story is going to run and run and and has some broader consequences there's a lot of discussion out there that you know we could be facing periods of much higher volatility in commodity prices as you know you've got deglobalization going on you've obviously got the energy transition that's playing into biofuels where i also know you're doing a lot of work you've got very high interest rates now I assume that the political interest is likely to come back in and start with the same arguments about the role of speculators, right? This you, is that debate or that that idea that sort of, and especially in the world of you know, the pop, more populist world we live in, you know, really across the West and globally, it's very easy to attack speculators. That's it's just not put to bed, right? I mean, do you see yourself and and Craig? back up in front of, of Congress in the next 10 years, you know, as a new suite of politicians bang this same old drum? Well, in fact, you've given me the chance to explain why did I write two books? Because I know this controversy is going to happen again. It'll be in a different form, slightly different villains, but it will happen again because of what I call the anti-speculation cycle. When prices go very high from a historical standpoint, there's economic pain on the consumption side. And naturally, there's a tendency for human beings to look for a villain. And speculators have historically been number one on that list. But it also works on the downside. When prices go very low, there's obviously real economic pain for producers. And they'll have a tendency to go look for the villain that is causing them such economic pain. And once again, speculators are typically the easiest target. And so I think this attack on speculation is endemic to price cycles and humans' emotional, psychological reaction to those kind of price changes. So 
I fully expect that this will all be repeated. And mm. that's part of why I wrote these books, that these will be helpful resources the next time this really happens. Yeah, and we're, we're seeing it play out already with the eye-watering returns of the oil majors trading. And no one really is talking to the fact that actually because of trading, because of efficient markets, Europe, the energy flowed in Europe, right? There wasn't catastrophic consequences. And, and you know, they sold in short order what was shaping up to be a, a really challenging social crisis, not least an energy crisis, but I will park that there. Well, it's been a a, a fascinating discussion. I, I hope we can have you back on and we'll dig into the indexes piece uh, later on in the year. But the the book we've been, I've been reading or we've read and really enjoyed is Back to the Futures, <laughs> Crashing Dirt Bikes, Chasing Cows and Unraveling the Mystery of the Commodity Futures Markets, which I thoroughly recommend. So thanks very much, Scott. Oh, it's my pleasure. I really enjoyed the conversation and I would love to do this again sometime in the near future. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and want to support the show, please give us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. To find out more about HC Insider and HC Group, a search and advisory firm dedicated to the commodity markets, visit our website at www.hcgroup.global. There you can find out more about our services and our offices around the world. There you can also find more content from interviews to insight pieces to more podcasts focused on the commodity value chains. Thanks again for listening.